Did the ancient rabbis believe that Isaiah 53 speaks of a suffering Messiah? Welcome to another episode in our series, Is Christianity the Mormonism of Judaism? Where we are discussing the claims of the Jewish rabbis who teach that Christianity has distorted the Jewish scriptures and misapplied prophecies to apply those prophecies to the Messiah in much the same way that we Christians believe that Mormonism has distorted our Christian scriptures and has misapplied verses, taking them out of context, and used verses that have nothing to do with how Mormonism applies those verses. The Jewish rabbis make that same claim for us Christians in our Christian scriptures. And they say that our Christian scriptures have misapplied the prophecies of the Old Testament to teach that Jesus fulfilled those prophecies as the promised Messiah. In our last video, we talked about Isaiah 53, which is one of the most popular passages that Christians use to show that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy to be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. But the Jewish rabbis disagree. They claim that Israel, the nation of Israel, is a suffering servant that was being spoken of in Isaiah 53. And in our last video, we went verse by verse through that chapter and discuss both the preceding verses leading up to Isaiah 53, the context of Isaiah 53, we talked about the nation of Israel being called God's servant in many of the chapters leading up to Isaiah 53, but we discussed how that shift from the nation of Israel as a servant of God is shifted to an individual in Isaiah 53 and does not speak of the nation as a whole, but rather an individual that comes out of the nation. And he is the one who fulfills the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Now, a couple of the things that we looked at that showed how the Jewish interpretation of Isaiah 53 does not fit the context are verses like verses we read in Isaiah 53 in the Jewish Bible. Like uh, beginning at verses 4, indeed he bore our illnesses. We saw that word illnesses can mean pains of sorrow or grief. And our pains he carried them, yet we uh, counted him as plagued, smitten by God and oppressed in verse 5. But he was pained because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him. And with his wounds, we were healed. And we talked about that. When has the nation of Israel ever been persecuted by the nations around her? And those nations that persecuted Israel received healing. If this passage, this suffering servant, who is wounded because of our transgressions, actually causes those that wound him healing, he causes them to receive healing. How can this be applied to the nation of Israel. God says that those who curse Israel he will curse and those who bless Israel he will bless. His pattern is always the same. He doesn't change his rules. In Isaiah 53 this servant who is persecuted, who is wounded because of our transgressions, he through his wounding brings healing to those who persecute him. But that is not what happens with the nation of Israel. When the nations around Israel persecuted Israel, God judged those nations. It's always been the case. He cursed those who curses Israel. So we see here in Isaiah 53 a clear example of why Isaiah 53 cannot be applied to the nation of Israel, but must be applied to an individual servant. And we also have to ask a second question on Isaiah 53. If we try to make that passage applicable to the nation of Israel rather to a, than to an individual like the Messiah Jesus, we have to ask the question about the punishment, the punishment that this servant receives. The servant is seen as being righteous. It says here in the scripture, in verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he would not open his mouth. Like a lamb to the slaughter, he was brought and he would not open his mouth. And from imprisonment, from judgment, he was taken. His generation, who shall tell? 
He didn't receive proper judgment. Why? Because he was innocent. And it says, For he was cut off from the land of the living because of the transgression of my people. A plague befell him or them, as the Jewish translation says. And it says in verse 9, He gave his grave to the wicked and to the wealthy with his kinds of death because he committed no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. This person who was persecuted, this this suffering servant of Isaiah 53 had no deceit, no violence, and yet the nation of Israel cannot be said to have had no deceit and no violence. In fact, we see over and over the nation of Israel violated God's laws. The nation of Israel was not innocent. Any judgment that the nation of Israel received was just. That's why it says in verse 8, from imprisonment and from judgment he was taken. So if this servant is Israel, how can that be said that that was fulfilled in verse 8? Because he was taken from judgment. He wasn't given proper judgment. We see that doesn't apply to the nation of Israel, but applies to the individual servant, Jesus, because he is innocent. So then we read on, it says, For he was wounded because of our transgressions. And it says here, verse 10, And the Lord's wish to crush him, he made him ill, for if his soul makes itself restitution, in other words, if his soul makes himself a guilt offering, that word for making itself restitution is actually the word for guilt offering in the Hebrew Bible. He shall see children. He shall see seed, as many translations say here at verse 10. And we see Jesus saw seed because he resurrected from the dead and he has many followers today who are the seed of Abraham, as the New Testament describes. Just like Satan has spiritual seed in Genesis 3, the seed of the serpent, we also see God has spiritual seed through Jesus. Jesus and the followers of Jesus become the spiritual seed of Jesus that is spoken of here, of the Messiah, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And then it says here in verse 12, he poured out his soul to death, and with transgressors he was counted, and he bore the sins of many, and interceded for the transgressors. So the second question is, when was Israel innocent? When did Israel intercede for the transgressors? How could this be applied to the nation of Israel? Rather, we see this can only be applied to an individual Messiah, and we believe the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, fulfills this. So that's just a short recap on what we covered last time. There was more discussed, uh, the meaning of words, some of the translational differences, and some of the different renderings in Isaiah 53 that you find in different translations. We discussed some of that, the Jewish arguments against the Christian interpretation. But ultimately, just looking at the context, reading Isaiah 53, and seeing how it moves from you know, in the broader context of before we get to Isaiah 53, the nation of Israel is the focus of God's as God's servant, then moves into a, a specific individual suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And we see that those promises and those passages that are spoken of in Isaiah 53 can only be applied to an individual servant, the Messiah. Now we're going to look at some other passages, and we're going to be examining the Jewish rabbis, the ancient Jewish rabbis' view of other passages, in addition to Isaiah 53, that they saw foreshadowed a suffering servant Messiah. Let's look at this. Now I'd like to look at another prophecy that indicates a suffering Messiah, and that is Zechariah chapter 12 particularly verse 10, but we're going to back up a little bit to get context here. Zechariah 12, starting at verse 8, where it says, In that day shall Hashem defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that stumbleth among them at the day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as a godlike being, as the angel of Hashem before them. So we have a context where it says here in verse 8 that Hashem, 
the Lord himself is going to defend Jerusalem. And we get down to verse 9, And it shall come a pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So this is a prophecy of the end times, when God is going to stand up and defend Jerusalem against her enemies. And it says in verse 10, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look unto me because they have thrust him through. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now here we have an interesting allusion to the one whom they have thrust through. Another word for that is pierced. A lot of translations put the word pierced here in this passage. So, and they shall look unto me because they have thrust him through. They have pierced him. Who is this talking about? And what are they mourning for? It says, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And then verse 11 it says, And in that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. And verse 12, And the land shall mourn every family apart. And on and on it goes about the mourning that is going to take place. Now the ancient rabbis were puzzled by these passages, both the one here in Isaiah 53 and the one here in Zechariah 12 where they see an allusion to someone who is suffering and to the people of Israel mourning this person who is pierced. I'd like to turn to some of the statements made by the ancient rabbis so that we can see how the ancient rabbis viewed these passages. And why is this significant? It's because New Testament Christianity came out of ancient rabbinic Judaism. Christianity began as a Jewish religion. And Jesus indeed was Jewish in his, in his own ministry. He started his ministry with the Jews and then later it was taken to the Gentiles. But Jesus was a Jew. And so to get an idea of what first century Jews believed about these passages, and that formed the very basis of the Christian belief about Jesus as the Messiah, we should look at ancient Jewish literature because that will give us an idea of how New Testament Christianity came out of ancient Judaism. And this is a very important point because we can look at the very same scriptures as we have been doing here, like in Isaiah 53. And as Christians, we see Jesus the Messiah being pierced, being crushed, and being, it pleased the Lord to crush him or to bruise him or to make him sick with, with uh, emotional pain and, and the calamity and, and that word for pierced. And we see this illusion of a pierced suffering servant. And then we read in Zechariah 12.10 of a servant who will be pierced or thrust through and the Jews are going to mourn for him in the end of days when the Lord shows up to defend her against her enemies. And you have the Christian view of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, dying and then resurrecting so that he sees his seed, his, spot, his posterity, his spiritual seed that follow. We see all of this, the Christian understanding of these passages. Was that the idea of ancient Judaism? Did the ancient Jewish rabbis see the same kinds of ideas in these passages? I'm going to suggest that they did. And here are some examples. Let's start with the Jewish prayer book called Yom Kippur Machzor Kobol Volume 2 Prayer Book. And this is an English translation of this Hebrew prayer. And it says, Our righteous Messiah has turned away from us. We have acted foolishly and there is no one to justify us. Our iniquities and the yoke of our transgressions he bears, and he is pierced for our transgressions. He carries our sins on his shoulder to find forgiveness for our iniquities. By his wounds we are healed. 
Isn't that incredible? This is an ancient Jewish rabbi saying, look, our righteous Messiah has been pierced for our transgressions, our iniquities and the yoke of our transgressions he bears. So he carries us sins on his shoulder to find forgiveness for our iniquities. By his wounds we, the Jews, are healed. Sounds like a Christian understanding of this passage of Isaiah. Yet this was written by a Jewish rabbi. Rabbi Eliezer, in the 7th century, wrote this prayer for the Yom Kippur Kobol, Volume 2 prayer book. Very interesting, isn't it? Christianity did not change the meaning of these passages when Christianity interpreted these passages. When the New Testament writers took these passages of Isaiah and applied them directly to Jesus, that was consistent with ancient rabbinic Judaism. It wasn't like Mormonism does to Christianity where Mormonism distorts the teachings of Christianity and is not consistent with the historic Christian views of these passages or verses of, of the scriptures. Christianity is not the Mormonism of Judaism. Christianity, in fact, agrees with ancient Judaism, as we are seeing here in the rabbinic writings. Let's go on. We're going to look at now a passage in the Jewish Talmud. The Talmud is the rabbinic understanding. The ancient rabbis would write their understandings and discuss these passages, what they thought these passages meant. And it's very interesting to read the Jewish Talmud because when we come to passages like Zechariah 12.10, where we read of a Messiah who's been pierced, who's been thrust through, and the people of Israel are mourning for him, we read an interesting exchange among the rabbis as they discuss this passage and try to figure out what is Israel mourning for. And who is this person who has been thrust through? I'm going to read to you from Saka chapter 52a in the Jewish Talmud. This is Saka 52a. And regarding this passage here in Zechariah, it reads, it is stated, quote, the land will eulogize, another word for mourn, each family separately, the family of the house of David separately and their women separately, the family of the house of Nathan separately and their women separately, Zechariah 12.12. 12. We were just reading that. I didn't read the, all the verses, all the, but it, it was the idea here, Israel is mourning. Okay, this is the context. Then they say, this indicates that at the end of days, a great eulogy will be organized during which the men and women will separate. They said, and are these matters not inferred? Eforchi? In other words, are these not inferred beforehand? If in the future, at the end of days, referred to in this prophecy, when people are involved in a great eulogy, and consequently the evil inclination does not dominate him, as typically during mourning, inappropriate thoughts and conduct are less likely. So evil inclination is another phrase here in the Jewish Talmud to refer to our sinful desires, okay, that sin nature that we all have. It says it will not dominate them during mourning, times of mourning. Inappropriate thoughts and conduct are less likely. And so they're asking the question, uh, uh, propos, the eulogy at the end of days, the Gemara asks, for what is the nature of this eulogy? The Gemara answers, Rabbi Dosa and, ra and the rabbis disagree concerning this matter. One said that this eulogy is for Messiah ben Yosef. That's uh, Messiah son, ben, son of Joseph. Messiah son of Joseph. Messiah ben Yosef, who was killed in the war of Gog and Magog, and prior to the ultimate redemption with the coming of Messiah ben David. So they were saying, well, one interpretation is that Messiah ben Yosef, Messiah the son of Joseph, would be killed during Gog and Magog. Maybe they were trying to figure out what is this allusion to someone who's thrust through that Israel is mourning. Could it be a Messiah who they called Messiah son of Joseph? And could it be that this Messiah was killed during a war with Gog and Magog? 
prior to the ultimate redemption, because, you know, here in the passage of Zechariah, God is going to come to defend Israel against her enemies. And so they're, they're speculating. Maybe this, this one who's thrust through, who's pierced, is actually somebody who was fighting in this final war with Gog and Magog that we read about in Ezekiel and other passages of the end times. And one said that, but that was one interpretation. The other interpretation, it says, and one said that this eulogy is for the evil inclination that was killed. Well, what's the evil inclination? Remember, we just read above, they said that evil inclination was the inappropriate thoughts and conduct. So, you know, so the other interpretation was, well, is it for, you know, sin nature being done away with? Let's read on what the rabbis conclude. The Gemara asks, granted, according to the one who said that the lament is for Messiah ben Yosef, Messiah, son of Joseph, who was killed, this would be the meaning of that which is written in the context, and they shall look unto me because they have thrust him through, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, quoting Zechariah 12.10, However, according to the one who said that the eulogy is for the evil inclination that was killed, does one need to conduct a eulogy for this? On the contrary, one should not conduct a celebration. Why then did they cry? So the whole point is, why are they crying? They wouldn't cry for sin nature being done away with. So it can't possibly be referring to that. That's not why the Jews were crying. As the rabbis concluded, it has to be for someone who they called Messiah ben Yosef. Messiah, son of Joseph. Now, I want you to think about this question. Why would the Messiah be called Messiah, son of Joseph? For what purpose? Why would they call him Messiah, son of Joseph? Isn't all the references to the Messiah, the coming reigning king, the reigning prince in the Old Testament, Messiah, son of David? So why would they say Messiah, son of Joseph? I'm going to suggest to you that the Jewish rabbis looking at this one who is going to be thrust through for their sins and this suffering servant who is going to bear the iniquities in Isaiah uh, 53, as we saw this one Jewish rabbi wrote about in the Yom Kippur prayer, they saw a suffering servant who would be rejected by God's people. That's why God's people are mourning, because it says in the very passage that they're talking about here in the Jewish Talmud, in Zechariah 12.10, and they shall look unto me because they have thrust him through. And I suggest to you that a few of those ancient rabbis were looking at these passages and seeing Israel mourning for someone who they had thrust through as being an allusion to the picture of Joseph in Egypt. And saying that just as Joseph in Egypt was rejected by his brothers and sent away and thought to be dead, his father thought he had died, right? Because they had, you know, uh, killed an animal and put blood on the coat and brought that back to his father, that they saw in these allusions here in the Old Testament about a suffering servant who would die, who would be thrust through, who all Israel would eventually mourn, they saw the picture of Joseph in Egypt, who was sent away, thought to be dead, but then eventually his brothers received him back. And they see here in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, the allusion to the Messiah, who they will look upon him who they had thrust through, and then they would mourn for him. All the families would mourn for him. And they would mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, because they will recognize their Messiah. Just like Joseph's brothers in Egypt, recognized him as their brother and received him back. That is the picture that's being carried here. And that is the picture that's being carried in the very terminology that the ancient rabbis used to refer to a Messiah who would be a suffering Messiah, one who would be put to death, this Messiah, Ben Yosef, Messiah, son of Joseph. Let's read on in the Jewish Talmud to get more ideas of how they understood these Old Testament passages of the suffering Messiah. 
We read on in Sukkot 52a, the sages taught to Messiah ben David, that's Messiah son of David, who is destined to be revealed swiftly in our time, the Holy One, blessed be he, says, ask of me anything and I will give you whatever you wish. As it is stated, I will tell the decree, the Lord said unto me, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Once the Messiah ben David, Messiah son of David, saw Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben Yosef, who was killed, he says to the Holy One, Blessed be he, master of the universe, I ask of you only the gift of life. Now, let's pause for a second here. There's a couple things going on here. The Jewish rabbis are looking at the passages of scripture here in Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, about a Messiah, son of David, who is going to be said of him, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for inheritance. The Jewish rabbis interpreted Psalm chapter 2, verse 8, about the Son, God's Son, being said, This day have I begotten you. What's significant about this? What is significant about this? This idea of a Son who would be begotten. Well, the very idea is that of, as the New Testament applies this passage to Jesus when he was resurrected, whenever a king was enthroned, it was said of him that he was begotten. In that sense, he, it meant that he had come into power. And when this passage is written, not of David himself, because David had already come to, to kingly power here, this passage was actually an allusion to the Messiah who would come to power. And in that time when he was resurrected, the New Testament applies this passage to him and says, this is just what it says here in Psalms chapter 2, when it says, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. It's saying that in Jesus' resurrection, he took on his kingly power. He became that Messiah, son of David, not just physically being born of the lineage of David, but now spiritually taking on that spiritual throne of David that someday will come and rule the earth. So the ancient sages looked at these passages the same way the New Testament writers did, looking at Psalms chapter 2 about a Messiah who is the son of God, saying, God saying to him, you are my son, this day have I begotten you, this is an allusion to him being God, or being the son of God, carrying the same power and authority of God, and they then say, once the Messiah, son of David, once the Messiah, ben David, saw Messiah, son of Joseph, saw Messiah, ben Yosef, who was killed, he says, holy one, blessed be he, master of the universe, I ask of you only life, now, this is very interesting because the rabbis were then, then had to answer the question, are there two messiahs coming? Is there one who is messiah son of David who's going to be king and the other who is messiah son of Joseph who's going to suffer for the sins of the people, be thrust through for the people, whether in the final battle of Armageddon or whether, you know, in the, Isaiah 53, they were undecided on how that was going to take place but they saw if you will two messiahs and in this passage here about the messiah this day have i begotten you you are my son this day have i begotten you ask of me and i will give you the nations for inheritance they saw an illusion if you will if this was one messiah and two different aspects of this messiah they saw in this passage a resurrection of Messiah son of Joseph to become Messiah son of David or they were questioning are there two separate messiahs coming two separate comings of a messiah one who is going to be son of David and one who is going to be son of Joseph the suffering messiah let's read on in the Jewish Talmud so he when he sees Messiah son of Joseph who was killed he says holy one blessed be he master of the universe I ask of you only life that I will not suffer the same fate. 
The Holy One, blessed be He, says to him, Life? Even before you stated this request, your father David already prophesied about you with regard to this matter precisely as it is stated. He asked life of you. You gave it to him, even lengths of days, forever and ever. Psalm 21 verse 5. So the ancient Jewish rabbi saw all of these passages and put them together and saying, this shows that the suffering Messiah who dies will either be resurrected to life or, in this case, they, they, they're kind of leaning toward the idea of two Messiahs coming. So the one that, that dies, this other Messiah who comes as king, is given the gift of life to reign forever and ever. And they're trying to sort this out. They don't quite understand it. They have another question because there's also an allusion to two comings of the Messiah in the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures. I'd like to read to you a question that the rabbis had about these messiahs. Rabbi Alexandri says in Sanhedrin 98a, Rabbi Ben Yeshua Ben Leva raises a contradiction between two depictions of the coming of the messiah. It is written, There came with the clouds of heaven one like unto a son of man, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom. Daniel seven thirteen through 14 And it is written, Behold, your king will come to you. He is just and victorious, lowly, and riding upon a donkey, and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9 Rabbi Alexandria explains, If the Jewish people merit redemption the messiah will come in a miraculous manner with the clouds of heaven if they do not merit redemption the messiah will come lowly and riding upon a donkey so they're trying to figure this out are there two messiahs coming there appear to be two comings of this messiah one on the clouds and the other on a donkey and so the way they reconciled it they say well it, the explanation must be that if we're worthy he comes on the clouds if we're not worthy he's going to be riding on a donkey lowly and yet, again, they're struggling with this Messiah, son of Joseph, who's going to be killed, thrust through, as they see in Zechariah 12 and Isaiah 53, and suffering for the sins of the people. And they see this Messiah, who's a kingly reign, who's asking for the gift of life, that he may reign forever, Messiah, son of David. Are there two Messiahs coming? What about these two comings of the Messiah? Or is it, as the Christians believe, and as the New Testament interprets these passages, it's one Messiah who comes two times, the first time to make an end of sin, the first time to suffer for the atonement, to make atonement for the people of God, and then the second time to deliver his people and to reign forever as King David, as that final King David who would reign. And as such, when he comes with his hands and feet thrust through, as we see in Zechariah 12.10, then the people will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, because they will realize what they have done to their Messiah and how they had rejected him all these years. Let's read on. What did the ancient rabbis do with these two Messiahs? We read over here in Sanhedrin 98b. Rav Yehuda says that Rav says, the Holy One, blessed be he, is destined to establish another David for the Jewish people as the Messiah, as it is stated, and they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will establish for them, Jeremiah 30 verse 9. It is not stated, I established, but I will establish indicating that the name of the future king will be David, Rav Papa said to Abai. But isn't it written, And my servant David shall be their prince forever, Ezekiel thirty-seven twenty-five, indicating that King David himself will rule over the Jewish people? They're trying to reconcile these passages. Abai said, They will rule in tandem, like an emperor and a viceroy. The Messiah will be king, and David will be second in command. So again, they're trying to reconcile these messiahs, these kingly passages, 
and these suffering servant passages and they end up with the conclusion well maybe God's going to raise David himself up and the Messiah will come and be the true supreme king David will serve under him that's one of their interpretations essentially like two messiahs they, they have Messiah son of Joseph they have Messiah son of David they're trying to reconcile these two and they come up with different interpretations maybe they'll be like a Messiah and a king reigning simultaneously that's one speculation they had what about the two comings of the Messiah well maybe if we're worthy he'll come you know on the clouds but if we're not worthy he'll come on a donkey or maybe could it be that these passages are one and the same Messiah they're referring to one Messiah who both comes on a donkey to pay for sins the suffering Messiah son of Joseph Inter interesting fact if we look over at John chapter 145 we have an interesting statement where Philip says talks about we have found the Messiah son of Joseph now that's interesting to see the phrase Messiah son of Joseph used in the New Testament and I do not believe that it was saying that this was the Messiah son of Joseph because Jesus's adopted father was Joseph I think it was an allusion to what the rabbis were talking about a suffering Messiah who was Messiah son of Joseph so when he says we have found the Messiah son of Joseph who the prophets spoke about when we read about that in the New Testament I think it's an allusion to these rabbinic teachings that the rabbis all taught about a suffering Messiah who would be called Messiah son of Joseph who would ride on the donkey and then these passages speak of the Messiah coming in the clouds and that's the future Messiah who will reign as King David Yeshua our Messiah our Mashiach is indeed the one and the same person who fulfills all these prophecies both in his first coming that's the Messiah son of Joseph prophecies and then in his future second coming when he rules as king and delivers Israel from her enemies they will look on him whom they have thrust through as we also read about in Revelation that Israel will look upon the one whom they have pierced and they will mourn as we see here in Zechariah 12 it's one and the same Messiah and I want to point to one more reference where we see the Messiah, the suffering servant, Isaiah 53. That very passage the ancient Jewish rabbis applied to the Messiah, not only in the Yom Kippur prayer that we just read, but also in the Jewish Talmud. I'd like to read to you here from Sanhedrin. We read, And the rabbis say, The leper of the house of Rabbi, Hahuda, Ha Nasi is his name, as it is stated, indeed, our illnesses he did bear, and our pains he endured, yet we did esteem him injured, stricken by God, and afflicted isaiah fifty three four Rav Nahuma says, if the Messiah is among the living in this generation, he is a person such as me, who already has dominion over the Jewish people. As it is stated, and their prince shall be of themselves, and their governor shall proceed from their midst. Jeremiah thirty, twenty-one. Rav says, if the Messiah is among the dead, he is a person such as Daniel, the beloved man. So, here's an interesting thing: they're quoting Isaiah fifty-three. The ancient rabbis quoting Isaiah fifty-three about him being the leper of the house of Rabbi Hahuda Hanasi because why because he did bear our pains he endured yet we did esteem him injured stricken by God and afflicted they applied these passages of Isaiah 53 to none other than an individual and they were speculating is this an individual who is among the living who's already ruling the people or is this an individual among the dead who will be resurrected like David or Daniel they were speculating about who this individual Messiah would be that fulfilled these passages of Isaiah 53 why do I bring this up because it's the rabbis of ancient Judaism that applied Isaiah 53 to individuals and they speculated about who that individual would be who would bear the iniquities and the sin and the pains and the sufferings of Israel or on behalf of Israel they recognized that it would only be fulfilled in an individual person 
And in fact, it isn't until we get to the Middle Ages under Rashi, who first came up with the idea that Isaiah 53 is not a reference to an individual Messiah, but rather a reference to the nation of Israel as a collective whole fulfilling the role of this servant who would be suffering in Isaiah 53. It was Rashi who came up with a new interpretation of this passage in the Middle Ages. Before Rashi, there was no interpretation of Isaiah 53 to refer to the nation of Israel. It was always applied to an individual person. And the rabbis would speculate about who that person would be. Whether that was somebody in the past, whether that was Moses, like in Soda 14, we're not going to read that right now, but Soda 14 talks about Moses and they try to apply Isaiah 53 to Moses saying that Moses fulfilled some of these aspects when Moses stood up on behalf of the nation of Israel and interceded for Israel. They saw those passages in Isaiah 53 about this servant interceding and suffering with the hands of in, in, in the case of Moses, he suffered with the people of Israel. On behalf of Israel's wickedness, Moses uh, offered his soul to God and said, Well, God, if you're not going to forgive them, in so many words, he said, Take my life. You know, he was standing on behalf of Israel and interceding for Israel. And the rabbis saw those parallels in Soda 14, and they described that, again, applying Isaiah 53 to an individual Messiah, not to some corporate nation of Israel that would corporately fulfill this role of suffering servant. So I bring this up to show that ancient Judaism is consistent with how the New Testament Christianity interpreted these passages. We see a lot of parallels with what ancient Jewish rabbis saw in these passages about a suffering servant, a Messiah who they called Messiah, son of Joseph. And indeed, not only do they look at the same prophecies that Christians look at today and that New Testament Christianity looked at when they quoted these ancient prophecies of Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, but the ancient rabbis made a statement here in Sanhedrin 99a. Rabbi Haya Bar Abba says that Rabbi Yohanan says in their prophecies with regard to redemption and the end of days, all the prophets prophesied only about the messianic heir. Did you catch that? In their prophecies, with regard to the redemption and the end of days, all the prophets prophesied only about the messianic heir. So what this means is the ancient rabbis were always looking at those prophecies that had any allusion to redemption, forgiveness of sins, and bringing about the deliverance of Israel from her enemies at the end of days, they looked at all those prophecies and said, look, let's see if we can find shadows of the Messiah, of the Messianic age, and see how all these prophecies are fulfilled. Essentially, in one man, these prophecies would culminate. As one man, they called the Messiah, son of David, son of Joseph, they speculated whether there would be two messiahs coming. They speculated how do we have two different comings of the messiah, one on the clouds, one on a donkey. And I submit to you that all of these questions the ancient rabbis had over these prophecies about the messiah were indeed fulfilled in Yeshua, our messiah, Jesus, in the past when he suffered as messiah son of Joseph, and then in the future they will be fulfilled. The kingly prophecies about Messiah, son of David, will be fulfilled when he returns to earth on the clouds as he promised. In Acts, we read that the Messiah will come back in the same way that he went up to heaven. And he will deliver Israel from her enemies, as we read about in Ezekiel and many other passages. And then in Zechariah, they will look on the Messiah, on this one whom they have pierced, who they have thrust through, and they will mourn for him. And then we will see the fulfillment of yet one more prophecy that we read about in the scriptures and that the Jewish rabbis commented on. Let me read here from Sanhedrin 98b. It says the Jewish people who will all suffer at the time when the Holy One, blessed be he, says these, the Jewish people are my handiwork, and those, the Gentiles, are my handiwork, 
how shall I destroy those on account of these? It appears that the Holy One, blessed be He, does not distinguish between the Jewish people and the Gentiles. That is why Rabbi Yohanan was concerned with regard to the coming of the Messiah. Because here, all right, here they were going to see that the Messiah was not going to distinguish between Jewish people and the Gentiles. Because why? Because what did Jesus say? In John ten, sixteen, I have other sheep who are not of this fold, this immediate fold, this Jewish fold he was ministering to. He said, I have come but to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. And then he says in John 10, I have other sheep who are not of this fold. Those also will I bring. And they will be one flock under one shepherd. And that will be the culmination that we will see when the Messiah comes. The Jews and the Gentiles together being one flock under one shepherd. Why? Because those of us who have been grafted into the vine, who have accepted Jesus as our Messiah, when the Jewish people recognize their Messiah, when he returns, we will all be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, and we will serve him as he will, he will forever minister to us, be our king, and establish his kingdom here on earth, just as he has done in heaven. Just as he has done in our hearts, then the nation of Israel will return to him as we see in the prophecies, and we will become one flock under one shepherd. And even the ancient rabbis saw that. That prophecy will be fulfilled when he comes, when the Holy One comes. In those days, it says, it appears the Holy One, blessed be he, does not distinguish between the Jewish people and the Gentiles. So here again, even they recognize there is going to be a time when all of us will be united in one flock under one shepherd, Yeshua, our Messiah. Isn't it beautiful to see how New Testament Christianity does not distort the teachings and the prophecies of the Old Testament, but rather agrees with those prophecies and with the interpretations in many cases that the ancient Jewish rabbis gave for these very same prophecies. As they saw a suffering Messiah, Messiah son of Joseph, and a kingly Messiah, Messiah son of David, ruling God's people and yet suffering for the sins of God's people. And in Christ, together, those prophecies are reconciled into one, one Messiah, who came the first time on a donkey and will come the second time on the clouds. Amen. Come Lord Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah.